Welcome back everyone to a top 10 video. Today is a top 10 most complex board games. So these are games that I've played or I own. So they're going to be games that I've found really hard to understand, really difficult rules, bad written rule books, lots of iconography, reference guides, how to use videos and forums to understand. So let's begin the list. Number 10 is Scythe by Stonemaier Games. This is a fantastic game set in a sort of post-apocalyptic dystopian Soviet uh, world. You play as uh, characters, you have sort of animal and cat companions. You have workers and mechs and units to explore, have combat, have objectives and encounters, uh, upgrade your player boards. Um, and there's a lot of sort of goals to wait and ways to win. Why is games on this list? Because the nature of the game itself, I mean, the game of, of, of combat, of building, upgrading, its exploration, a huge sprawling map, lots of resource types, uh, lots of uh, goals, different ways to win the game, and hidden objectives, um, encounters, um, how the mechs work, how each player faction is slightly different, combat cars, how combat works. There's a lot of things in this game, a lot of components and sort of little fiddly rules to understand. I mean, the basic actions on the player themselves aren't hard. I mean, you do one action of one, or the bottom action of it, or both if, if you can. Um, and the game has great rules, written very well, much like all Stamina games are. But a game of this nature, you have so much going on at once, such a huge board and lots of restrictions. You can't go for this entirely to upgrade your board first, you need to upgrade to go across here, place your area down there. You want to get more resources, you've got to pay to get more workers. And then you've got workers out, you've got your combat track, your popularity track, your money, your currency. And it's also about eight different objectives too, like winning combat, doing certain encounters. Um, getting your workers out, your mechs out. There's so much stuff going on at once, so, much thing, so many things happening at once. And also, it has a very difficult to understand ultimate system. So ultimate is how so many games have their AI player play. And as great as they are, this one is very hard to understand. Not just because you're basically using sort of cards to basically act like another player, but something as simple as the move action. It's so hard to understand. I mean, you've got worker movement, mech movement, character movement, and counter card sort of space movement. Such a unique and interesting game. Very interesting uh, mechanics, but very hard to understand. Number nine is a game I brought this year and I love. I played it to death. It is Ark Nova. So Ark Nova is a game where you build your own zoo. Basically, raise your player board, you get enclosures, play animals, trigger abilities, increase the reputation of your zoo, your conservation counters, your appeal counters, play better animals, you know, get certain icons to get certain symbols, to trade conservation effects and get a high score and win. The thing about Nova is, even though the premise sounds quite simple, and it does look nice just building a zoo, placing enclosures down your board, the right space, the right size, place an animal, there's a lot more to it than that. You have cars on a sliding scale, which does work quite well, which the civilization New Dawn does, but it's the way that the game has limitations and lots of icons, like Terraforming Mars, you need icons for certain things. And icons trigger certain abilities, sponsor cars, do certain things. When you play with an animal, it'll do certain things. You need certain part of zoos, certain animals, certain universities, get reputation higher. So there's just so many things at once, so many components. And looking for symbols and looking for limitations and looking if you can play that card, can you do that? Can you do this this turn? You need the income for it, you need to, the space and closure for it. But also how the game scoring is, is where it's quite confusing too. I mean, you have the conservation uh, track and the uh, appeal track. And the game is only ended when those two tracks sort of progress and collide and pass each other, that's when the end game is triggered. Then you basically sort of minus your conservation appeal score for your actual appeal score and you get your sort of main score. And it feels quite strange because you do a lot of things in the game, play a lot of animals, and your score could be like minus four or like ten. And it's like it doesn't feel like it's you've done a lot, even though you have. It's a weird way to score the game. And it's quite hard for players to understand. I mean I mean the rules are written fantastically. It's explained quite well, lots of examples which I really do appreciate. And the reference guide sheet and booklet explains all sponsor cards is fantastic too. But it's just a lot of things to take for a new player at first. A lot of things going at once, a lot of cards and symbols. Symbols everywhere for this game. It's a great game, but be wary when you play it. It might take a little bit of thinking first. Number eight is Gloomhaven, a big epic RPG game. Gloomhaven itself is a monster of a game. If you ever see the box this game on the shelf in a store, it dominates the shelf. It's like a chest. It's just massive. It's very expensive. It's just full of components and tiles and cards and tokens and bits everywhere. And it's very, very overwhelming. Now, Jaws of the Lion, the smaller standalone box version of the game, is a bit better for new players, especially. 
because the first class scenarios are like a tutorial, they teach you the game basics and get progressively more advanced as you play. And by the time you hit scenario five, you're ready for the full game. And that's really fantastic. But the base game itself, the main game, um, there's so many things at once. I mean, how your player cards work, each character's different, how the monsters work and their all their keywords, all their effects. Um these the how the there's items and elemental infusions, how elements work and how you gain XP and use your gold and XP to upgrade your characters and your get new cards and stuff in and how cards can have certain limitations, are you in range, will it hit you? And also the attack deck as well. I mean it's quite a, a weird thing to attack and put all your effort into attack and then draw an attack card and get like a zero or a, 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 you know the, the curse kind of card and get no damage. It's quite there's just a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's a great way to have an RPG connected to a board game, which I really appreciate because I love RPG games, but you have to understand that RPG games themselves, like you know, like, like Final Fantasy, is confusing. They're all confusing. Any Final Fantasy game comes out, it's always hard to understand how the mechanics work, how combat works, and how your XP system works. It's the same for this. It's like learning a whole new RPG game. It's well worth the uh, investment, for sure, but it is a bit much for sort of new players who want to sort of nice game to play, it's going to be very overwhelming for them, and a lot to take in. Number 7 and 6, I was quite torn between the two, both from the same developer, that weird. I um, wasn't really sure which one to put first, but I'm going to put this one in number 7, this is Root by Leader Games, and this is a fantastic game of war, area control, unique player powers, with a great, unique, sort of weird critter art style. Um, you basically play as a unique faction, and you fight and brawl and use your player powers, your abilities to spread across the map and you have your own sort of way of getting victory points. So the basics of roots aren't too hard. The sort of like medium complexity, like how you move, how you rule a clearing, how combat works, how crafting works, isn't too bad. But each of the factions of roots is completely different. When you get the core game of roots, you get four factions, and each one is like learning a new game. You can play the first faction, so you play as Marquis the Cats, then you go to the Eerie Dynasty, the, the birds, and it's so different. They play so different. The cats will basically have a lot of units out on the board at once and basically play buildings and sawmill tokens and expand and spread across the board. The birds um, place cards and slot on top of their board and the cards will trigger certain actions and certain clearings, that same thing, like a fox clearing or a rabbit clearing. And they'll be they'll start off quite strong, they'll grow quite fast and grow and spread really quickly. But if they don't play a card at the right point, they'll fall into turmoil and sort of you know, back on themselves a little bit. So that's the thing with Root, it's hard for getting sort of four players to play the game because the game itself is confusing and all the factions are hard to understand, I won't deny this, the factions are difficult. They all have certain phases, certain things that trigger, how they do, how they craft all different, how they some have certain abilities in combat, some have certain things, they score certain VP in certain ways, they all score VP in certain different ways, they can't, it's not all the same. For instance, Marquis the Cat scores VP for buildings being placed and the more that buildings you have the same tab, or VP you get. Whereas the Vagabond goes to clearings Cleavings as one little pawn and goes on quests and gives items to players and uses items to do certain actions and certain abilities. So with Root, the rules are great. Um, they're written quite well. They reference guard cards that tell you how certain factions work. But you need a full understanding of all the factions and how everything works to fully enjoy the game. Because if you don't understand how a faction works, you don't understand how much of a threat that player is. So it's one of the games where you need to basically all fully immerse yourselves in each faction and all go around the board and understand the factions. That's the thing, so it's like learning four games in one. That's a root size list. It's a very hard game to understand. Number six by Leader Games is Oath, Chronicles of Empire and Exile. This is a big campaign legacy uh, game of diplomacy and betrayal and alliance and stuff. It's a big map. Um, you play as either a chancellor or a citizen. You choose a goal out at the start. It might be something like rule the most sites or have a certain banner. And the chancellor has to basically haunt that banner. For the, for so many rounds to win. And the citizens must fight back and rebel and regain the banner by basically completing the objectives themselves, like control more sites than them. But not just that, there's also secret objectives too, um, and you can spread out more, you can discover sites, you can play sites to your character board or the location you are, get relics, give you certain powers, use uh, war bands on the board to get, to get abilities in combat as well. So, two things that this game is so difficult. Um, Basics, some of the game's basics aren't too bad, some of the actions aren't too bad at all, like how you move, how you get certain relics and stuff. But the campaign action and how you win are the hardest parts of this game, but also most crucial parts to understand. Um, so campaigning, you don't attach the player, you attack the site, their pawn, certain relics. 
you have to understand, plus why you need to understand how the combat works fully before you make an attack, because if you don't understand how combat works, you can go into an attack completely unprepared and just get slaughtered. You have to have a few things, you have to have more warbands on your board ready for attack. Because you can only want so many dice to have warbands, and also if, if they rule the sides, you have to attack the side. If the side's quite heavily fortified, you can't break for the side first. If you want to attack their pawn, only on the same space as their pawn, or say a relic too, all relics give their blue dice, so defense dice bonuses, can you can you can you take the risk? Can you overcome the dice rolls? So there's a lot there to take in. And also how you win as well. It's not just like one way of winning. You don't basically beat the Chancellor. It's not like a 5v1 game. Of course you can win that way. You can of course win that way. But there's also a secret vision card you can draw. And it's like a hidden information. And that'll give you a secret win condition. Then when you play it face up, you can then win the game at a certain point. But you have to understand how all these endgame conditions are triggered and how they work. Even the Chancellor can offer citizenship to an exile and become a citizen. And they can win together, or they can overthrow the, the Chancellor and be a success to sort of betray them. So there's so many elements of, of how the game is played and how the game is won. But like Roots, you have to understand the game fully. How combat works, how endgame scoring works, how visions work, how warbands work on certain spaces to enjoy the game. As much as I love this game, um, I have yet to bring it to a game group because it's hard to teach, it's hard to sort of get into the game. It's got really good written rules and like roots, reference guides are great, but there's just so many things happening at once in a game of hidden information, secret win conditions and stuff. It's hard to sort of teach openly to people. But it's probably for the right game group, it's probably perfect. But it's a very, very advanced, very big game, uh, very overwhelming, and a lot of things happening at once and a lot of information is taken. Number five is Too Many Bones by Chip Fury Games. This is one of my favourite RPG sort of solo play games to play. You basically play as a Gearlock and use dice to upgrade your character, and dice does combat and certain effects, trigger abilities. Um, you basically go and sort more little grid mats and use poker chips as enemies in your character. Enemies move and attack of certain keywords and abilities. Um, and it's a, it's a really great game. It's an RPG game you draw on counter cards. It's called Tongue and Cheek Humor. Not really play value, quite difficult in, in times. But it's like Roots where each each player or each Gearlock sort of player. It's so different, they all play so different to each other. How they use dice is different, how they attack is different, how they have certain skills, how they upgrade, and their innate powers and use special abilities are so different to each other. The basis of Tony Bowman's as well is quite confusing, how combat works, how all the enemies move, there's so many keywords, there's a huge chart of keywords. Everything the enemy does, you know, sort of like the bleed effects, the um, AK units, the Krellin units, undertow, so many things happening at once. How and all the encounters are modified too. It's not just like basically you have to fight an enemy. The encounter could be modified based on what count cards you draw. You might say this turn, enemies do this, or you can do this, or this is an ability. There's a lot of things taken, a lot of reading as well. Um, it's just understanding the Gilux is the worst part because you, you have the reference guide, but you're going to constantly back and forth. I mean, even now there's so many plays, I'm still getting the reference guide out and looking and going, yes, this does this, this does this, this does this, I think I got it right. So it's a game where you have to understand the Gilux. Even for experienced Tony Bones players, if they buy a new gear lock, it's hard to understand because they all behave so differently. They aren't basically brute attackers or just a healer. They all use dice in certain ways and affect the battlefield in certain conditions and certain abilities. So it's a game that's um, it's a great game. Very expensive, but very highly polished. But it's a game that requires your full investment of your time and your effort to understand and fully enjoy. Number four is a favourite solo game of mine. It is Spirit Island. By greater than games. This is a game where you play as a god or a deity and you must repel invaders from your island using your special powers, destroy them, generate fear, and win. The game is hard for a few reasons. One, there's so many rules, so many phases and components, and different how actions work, how the cards work, how elements work, how the invaders work, how fear cards do certain effects, how the Han work, how combat works. There's so many elements to the game, so many phases. Um, the rules aren't written badly. But there's just so many of them. It's just so big. There's so many things at once. And once you learn the basis of the game, you've got the adversaries and the scenario cards too that add so much more complexity to the game. They alter the gameplay so much. And like uh, Tony Bones, each character, each spirit, should I say, plays so differently. They all play so differently. They're all so strange. Some are more aggressive, some are faster, some are slower, some are more supportive. Some use the hand to advantage. Some use a better, a better gain um, energy early on. Some don't get energy quite fast and play cards faster. Some use certain elements to advantage. There's just so many things going on at once this game. The invaders too, how the available works, how they spread out, how they build buildings, how they ravage, how they attack the hand, how they attack you, how they attack your growth tokens, your, your counters. It's hard to explain this game by just saying it's just a big epic game with so many rules 
it's it's a hard game too. It's very difficult. It's quite punishing and quite brutal. And some spirits don't feel so great at first. Some spirits feel quite bad. But a lot of times, it's because you understand the spirits, how they work. I mean, of course, some are better than others, that's for sure. But some require different strategies. Some require you to hang back a bit or use the hand to advantage or be really careful when you place things. But weighing your cards too, I mean, each card has certain conditions. Like it might say, you can play so far from a presence you've got on the board. It might say you can play a certain land or a certain, it might be a blight area or it might be a non-blight area. It might have invaders in there. So all the cards have restrictions too. So it's just a lot to take in. Uh, much like it is when you bones, each time you get a new spirit, it feels different. It feels like you're learning the game again. So it's a game that's quite hard to teach, but well worth the investment if you can get into it. Number three is a sci-fi game. This is Guy Project. And this is an epic space game of resource management and upgrading and technology and spreading out and colonizing planets and terraforming planets. First of all, this game, uh, I love this game. When I first got this game, I was so overwhelmed with it. I was so confused because there's just so much going on at once in the game. There's like three or four boards. There's a unique faction board with different abilities and upgrade options. There's the sprawling map of all different planets and space. There's a research board, different tracks, different keywords and icons everywhere all across the board. There's an end game scoring board, a round scoring board too, the booster icons, there's the different resources work, there's how power works. There's just so many things at once to take in. It's so difficult to understand. And it's a game that's full of restrictions too. It's not a game where you can just basically think, can I colonize that planet? Can I put any resources? Is it in range? Is it the right pilot type? Can you afford to terraform it? Can you afford to make it your planet? Is it a tra transiting planet? Can you send a terraform across, make it into a certain planet type you need? There's just so many things to understand. And each each faction board upgrades buildings and sets different local abilities differently. Get resources differently. They all play differently too. So there's so many things to sort of take in at once. It's just a big, epic game. It's a great game, but it's one that's going to be so hard to teach unless you're fully immersed in the rules. If you didn't get the rules spot on, it's going to be a game where you can miss things easily and struggle because there's a lot of the ways to get resources, understanding how to manage your resources, how to save things for another round just in case, or how planets work, how the calls of planets affects your board, how you can terraform certain planets, how research tiles work, how federations work, how free actions work, how QIC tokens work. There's just so much going on in this game at once. It's a brilliant game. It's fantastic when you once you understand it. But it's a game that you might get put off at first because it's so confusing. It's a game what might, you know, people might see to try it and not enjoy it because it's so hard to get into. But once you break past that barrier and get through the rules and watching the videos and forums, it's worth the effort. But it is so complex. Number two is another sci-fi game. It is Nemesis. I've only played Nemesis a few times, but each time I play, I understand why it's so hard. It's a game that's much like the Aliens franchise. You basically you have a certain role, wake up on a ship, you have a certain hidden objective at some point, there's hidden information on tiles and certain rooms you have to explore, trigger certain endgame win conditions and escape or take everyone out. You know, certain funny conditions as well. And also you've got aliens attacking the ship, strong aliens that get stronger, you have to fight them, they can affect you and then you could win the game but be infected and not win the game. Some, basic, some of the game basics aren't too bad, like how you move and explore and fight, isn't too hard to understand, isn't too hard to grasp. Whereas the fact that there's so many hidden information on the tiles, in there's loads of rooms that do certain things, each room is for a certain purpose. You have to fully understand the purpose of each room before you even explore because there's no point going to a room, you don't know what it does. And then you've got your win condition too, you might say you turn on the power or check this or send a signal and you think, well, what's that? You don't understand, you've got to go all up there, cross down there, and then you've got to trigger certain events or certain things happen, certain catastrophes happen on the ship and it changes how the game plays. And then also the game's playing two ways, you've got co-op and semi-co-op. Co-op's great for new players, you all work together. But with semi-co-op, you have your own goals, so you can basically backstab each other and betray each other. And a game like that with sort of randomness and chaoticness and sometimes elimination, you can get learned from the game as well quite early on. It makes it quite brutal and quite intimidating to play at first. I think the game's very atmospheric, and I love the uh, theme of the game. There's a game that's very brutal and very harsh on newer players to understand. Purely because if you don't understand how other players' goals work and how certain things are triggered. If you don't understand how to escape on a pod, if you don't understand how to restore power, if you don't understand how to get basically rid of an infection, you're going to lose. You get eliminated and the game's going to be no fun for you at all. And that's why the game is high on its list because it's so brutal, so demanding, so chaotic and random. Number one, the most confusing game I've ever played. It is an epic space game. It is Twilight Imperium, 4th edition. This is not a game. This is an event. Play this game is like an event. You just have to set aside time get psyched up, get motivated, understand it's going to take hours, days even. There's so many things at once, like Guy Project, 
It's a big space game, exploration, combat, diplomacy, um, weird conditions, uh, technologies, upgrading, pl unique player f uh, boards and factions. It's just one of the games where there's so much taken at once. Looking at this game itself on a table is so intimidating. It's just so big. All the plastic units and all the, the core of win conditions, the, the abilities, the planet types, the, the ways your combat works, the way you get a certain command title to do certain effects and certain bonuses on your turn. There's just so much at once. One of the games where you constantly back and forth the reference guide and constantly look at the rules. It's a game that's so hard to teach. It's so hard to fully immerse yourself in because you're going to lose the immersion going to the rules all the time. It's a strange thing because despite the intimidation and how overwhelming it is and how confusing it is and how much of a mess it is and how I'm constantly looking at the reference guide and understanding how things work and it's scratching your head all the time and it's like it takes hours and days. It's a great experience. It's a really fun, fun game. It's a game with the right game group. You have players who love a big, epic, long sci-fi game who want a big, confusing, epic game of combat um, and exploration set in space. It's perfect for the game group. But if you're a casual gamer, like more accessible games with a nicer theme and sort of games that aren't too heavy or aren't too long-winded or aren't too as epic as this. It's going to be so overwhelming for you at first. It's going to be such a complex game. Even for players like me who like complex games, who like big games, who like space games, this game is very intimidating. It's very confusing. It's one of the games where when we play it, it's almost like a joke. Do you want to play Twilight Imperium? Because we know it's, it's just like an investment of your time and your energy and your effort. It's a, it's a pure brain, brain scratcher. It is a commitment. To play this game is a commitment to a whole day <laughs> to play this game. And at higher player counts, at four or five, or even six or seven, the expansion Prophecy of the Kings, wow, this game is going to take absolutely days, maybe even weeks. And that's why this game is number one. It's the investment of your time, your effort, and your brain cells. And that's it for this uh, top ten list. Uh, any suggestions, uh, comment down below. Any games you think should be on this list. Um, obviously, this game is based on ones that I've played. But comment anyway, or games you think I might like based on the suggestions on this list. As always, like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.